team at staff. So I'm going to take you through our session this morning. We're still waiting for a few more people to dial in, but I'm going to make it a start. So we might have people popping in in the next minute or so. And just by way of a, um, a bit of a preamble, just to talk to you a little bit about how the webinar is going to run. Um, you all have no doubt noticed that you are all on um, you are all on mute. Obviously this keeps the background noise from your offices and so on just down to down to an absolute minimum. But um, if you want to ask a question, you are absolutely encouraged to do so. And you have a you have a question facility rather than using the chat, use the question facility so that we can um, actually respond to those. If you use the question facility, what this does is keeps a log, so we'll be able to come back to you and respond to your questions um, after the session if we don't get to them this morning. Just to also note that occasionally webinars um, have a little bit of a, um, an interruption in our signal. We might find you have a bit of an audio issue. If you do, you can literally exit out of your, if you've dialed in through your PC, which lots of you have from what I can see. You can actually redial using your phone and just listen to the webinar. And obviously what we'll do is make sure that all of the slides will be distributed and obviously what we'll also do is at the, at the same time, make sure that we can share the link of the webcast. So as far as the, the session also goes, we'll have a feedback form for you, which we'll also email to you after the session today. And of course, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, you are able to contact us through our apprenticeship kind of support line here at Staffs. So by way of starting, what I wanted to do initially is just see if we can find a little bit more about, about you. So I'm just going to launch a bit of a poll. We've got quite a few of these going through the session today, just to help us in staff get a view of what's important to you and also for you to understand a bit more about each other. So you're going to see a poll come up on your screen with any look, any point in that. We're just going to make sure the technology is behaving itself today. So we want to know something really simple initially. So you should have any seconds now. You should have the poll coming up and we're just looking for you to answer that. So let's have a look. OK, good. What we should see now then is the responses coming up. Oh, OK, we haven't got those. Why haven't we got those? We have had a bit of a day with the polls not behaving themselves. Let's have a look. Here we go. It should come up now. OK, there we go. So we've got a very kind of interesting group with us today. Then we've got most people well, spread between um, kind of six and 12 months and 24 months. We've got a range of people with a range of experience, which is always really good. OK, so let's move on in our session then today. OK. What we want to talk about then today in our session is how you make the most of your apprenticeship. And there are lots of things I want to talk to you about this morning that hopefully will make put your, your apprenticeship in context, really. We're going to talk a little bit about your responsibilities as an apprentice and what that actually means, because you do have kind of responsibility for the success of your apprenticeship programme, you know, as a tripartite relationship between you, your line manager, your mentor, and obviously the, the staff here at staff at the university. What I'm going to talk you through also is what to take from your paperwork. There is lots and lots of paperwork that's a requirement for apprentices, you'll probably know, particularly those of you that are, are kind of started most recently. I'm going to explain to you how that paperwork works, what it's there for, and how you can use it as part of your apprenticeship journey. Then we're going to spend the rest of the session talking about continuous improvement, really, and looking at how you can make sure that the tripartite reviews that you should be undertaking regularly can support you. We're going to talk to you about how you make the most of your feedback and how you use that to prep up for your endpoint assessment. Then a little bit at the end about how you can have your say and help us here at the university improve the programme, not just for you, but for people that come on the programme in future. So I want to do another quick poll now and just find out a little bit more again about you and why you started your degree programme. So I've got some options for you here. So you want to really know what it is that started you off on your journey. So let us know. You should see this coming up now. Okay, okay. let's have a look. So you want to answer that one? Ah, okay, good stuff. Let's show you the results then. OK, again, so you can see on screen that for most people, then it was about career development or it was an opportunity to study without the, without the student loan burden, which we know is, of course, a really, really important feature of how apprenticeships can help us in our studies. OK, so in that case, then let's move on. Let's talk about our next topic. So what I'm interested in talking to you about now, then, really, is just as we start our 
our session today in the middle of well on the end really of national apprenticeship week for 2019 just a bit of a reminder really that you are one of a really really important band of people and on average now as you can see from the screen there's about 375,000 apprentices who start an apprenticeship every year and that's actually dipped slightly over the last couple of years because of the way the apprenticeship program is now runs and at its height it was almost half a million so even though you might be part of quite a small cohort in your apprenticeship program there are almost 400,000 people, 400,000 apprentices that start each year. And again, at its height, that means that on programme, as we've seen from the response that you've given to the polls, we've got some people in their first year and some in their second. If you count everybody that's actually on an apprenticeship, it's, at its height, it was almost a million apprentices every year. So even though, as I said, you might be part of a small cohort, the apprenticeship programme is really, really big. It's government's flagship programme and it's one of our core offers in Staffordshire to give out to employers to help people who are already in work, help them have a structured learning programme. And in staff, we've been right at the forefront of this because when the apprenticeship programme first started to move into degree level apprenticeships in about 2014, this was long before the new apprenticeship reforms were in place, we'd already started um, with our apprenticeship program at that point and because we now have over 400 apprentices across the university studying for 16 different apprenticeships and our program will continue to expand and just like other universities this is a core part of our offer and we're really pleased to to have apprentices part of our cohort at the university so what we want to know now and talk to you about is what your responsibilities are as an apprentice and and I know that as, as part of this you will have had, heard some of this in your induction it's really just a refresher to remind you what it is that your contribution is to the program so we're going to ask another quick poll now I really want to know what you thought your your biggest challenge was in your early months because we know that that first that first session is really really tough in that first three months so tell us what you think your challenges were and you'll see in this particular poll we've got an option for other so if you want to tick um, any of these or if you've got other kind of reasons that or other challenges from your first three months tell us what you can actually do is just tick other and then type something into that question line and I'll read some of those out so the poll's just coming up now so hopefully you can see that now I'm just going to check yep so the poll is there so Let's see what people have to say. OK, so if you've ticked other, there's a few people that have to based on how the polls stacking up now. Just tick that and then type something into the question line. I'll pick those up in a second. Tell us what your other means then. What was your other biggest challenge in those early months? Let's have a look. OK, I'm just going to close that now. So you can see that coming up on screen. And what we can see from this, Again, is and again very very typical. It is one of two things on the whole. And I'll come to the do type something into the question line if you if you've ticked other. And I'll pick those up in a second. And we know that the big two big challenges are just getting used to trying to cope with your day to day workload, and obviously managing your um, your time at the university and your general study time too. And for lots of people, as you can see from our almost three quarters of everybody that's replied this morning, it's not just about work and your apprenticeship. It's about homework and your apprenticeship so we know that managing that kind of work-life balance can be a particular challenge during your apprenticeship i'm going to come to some points about that in a second so let's have a look and see if anyone's typed anything onto the line where we, where they typed other oh, well whoops nobody has so far so let's have a look then and see if you want got a minute just to type something in if you've ticked other what was your big challenge and we'll come back to that in a second okay so let's move on so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what your apprenticeship journey is all about. And you can see from your screen here that there are, you know, kind of a, a dozen or so steps really in for any apprentice, regardless of how long their program actually is, whether it's 12 months or indeed three years. Oh, Paige has just popped in with a, what the big challenge was. And Paige was saying that it was about not being organised and having a lack of information. Paige, if that's something that you think we can help with, then just tell us what it is that you think we ought to do to help you with, with that and what we could do for new starters. Let us know. So again, going back to your journey, part of this is, as you can see at the start, making sure that when you're recruited that you are clear about the apprenticeship that you are actually following. And you can see from the bottom of this diagram here, there are a couple of um, little icons here. All those icons are about bits of paper usually or bits of paperwork or questions or queries. And where we've got the two little speech bubbles, that means that there's some kind of dialogue that might need to take place. So what we're talking about in the, in the journey then really is once you are recruited, being really, really clear about the standard that you are actually following. 
And for this, you need two documents. You need a copy of the apprenticeship standard itself, and you usually need a copy of the assessment plan, which tells you what your endpoint assessment will actually comprise of. The next stage in your journey will have been an initial needs assessment. And we're going to talk a bit about this later on because that is such an important part of your apprenticeship and not just at the start either. Your initial needs assessment actually sets up any prior learning that you have and also it sets the content for your apprenticeship journey. So we're going to look at that to set in more detail in a second. And of course, what we also need from you at this point is we need evidence of your um, English and maths or indeed any certification that you've had that counts towards your prior learning. And what we'll normally do is follow up with you if we're not if we're not clear any more information. So we normally might have a dialogue with you fairly early in the process. What this all does then is produces one of the key, well the two key bits of documentation that govern your apprenticeship program. We're going to touch on these again later. The first is the commitment statement, and this is what we create out of your individual needs assessment. Is that we create a, a learning plan which sets out for you. The, the order of modules and the content of your programme that you will actually follow and of course spell out in that the amount of time that you'll need to spend in off the job learning. I'm going to come to that later on also. Now what we also do is you and your employer sign your apprenticeship agreement and you'll know that the commitment statement also has to be signed by you, by your line manager or your employer and also by the university and that really is your your statement your contract if you like your agreement with your employer and with the university about how your apprenticeship program is actually going to run and it contains a whole stack of information about important policies and where the funding comes from as well as your individual learning plan which drives your program then of course you go through enrollment and induction again for some of you that would have been quite recent and the bulk of your program is then spent in five and six in those boxes in the center of your screen and that is where I would imagine most of you are now you are sat now cycling between your on the job learning so as you acquire your skills and experience in the workplace which is where you spend 80 percent of your time in an apprenticeship and on the 20 percent off the job that you spend either on campus or working on your assignments or indeed doing other off the job activities in the workplace or doing reading or research, whatever it might actually be. So all of that off the job activity is all that all the central skills acquisition that you have during your apprenticeship. And the other absolutely critical phase out of all of this is your tripartite reviews. And these should be taking place terminally or quarterly, and they are a three way progress review, as you know, between you, your line manager and your mentor and your academic mentor in the workplace, in the, in the university. And those tripartite reviews are a fundamental part of the process of being an apprentice. We're going to touch on those in more detail also later on. We also want to make sure that it's happening at this point it too is feedback. We want to talk a bit about feedback again at the end of our session this morning. We want to give you maximum opportunities to make sure that you have all of your feedback built into how we develop and re-engineer the program as I mentioned before, but also you're collecting feedback too about your own progress. So we're going to come to that later on today. And then obviously for as everyone is moving towards the end of their program, I'm not sure if any of you are at this quite at this point now but what will obviously happen is that the the process of your endpoint assessment will start to take place and that will culminate in terms of your preparation with a gateway review and that gateway review is the point at which you the university and your line manager or mentor decide whether or not you are ready to undertake your endpoint assessment the endpoint assessment itself then takes place once the gateway review has been passed and you've passed any underpinning qualifications, including your degree, if your apprenticeship includes a degree. And that then, once you've reached that point, you go ahead and take your endpoint assessment, because those will vary from apprenticeship to apprenticeship. And after that, we have our success celebration, graduation and your completing of your apprenticeship and your, your degree. Then after that, we have course feedback and of course we have all the alumni processes that the university has put in place to make sure that we continue to keep talking to you and keep you close to the kind of work that we can see how we can support you to progress to other apprenticeships and other learning. So that should be a fairly typical picture, really, of the journey that you will have experienced or are in the middle of indeed. And as I said, we're going to spend a lot of our time today looking at that bit in the middle around the tripartite review and that workplace learning. So in terms of your responsibilities then, what does that boil down to? Well, you can see on the screen in front of you here, there are a number of things that are really important, some of which are before you start and some of which are during your programme. So the thing that we absolutely have to do, as you know, before you start is make sure we have evidence that you are eligible to be an apprentice. 
And again, I'm sure some of you will have experienced the deep joy of trying to find your English and math certificates, which we know not just in the university, but generally across the apprenticeship programme is a is a major source of frustration for everybody. But we have to have them as part of the eligibility. And if not, as you know, we'll be supporting you to go through an English, English and or maths programme. You have to complete those before you can actually go to your gateway review. So part is about collecting eligibility from you. We collect lots of information about you as an individual. And also we have to collect any prior learning information that you have, again, which is all part of us forming that individualised plan for you. Other responsibilities that, are, that sit with you are to make sure that your offer job learning takes place in the way that we have planned it. And what offer job learning means in a summary is that it is the time that you spend where you are not undertaking your usual job or the usual tasks that make up your job. So off the job learning can absolutely take place at your place of work. For example, if you're sat at work writing an assignment, you might be shadowing somebody to get some experience, a particular skill that you maybe don't kind of currently do in your role. You could be um, undertaking another piece of training. You could be researching. All of that is off the job, as you'll see later on. And you have to spend 20% of your time as an apprentice on that off the job learning. And we plan for that off the job learning to take place during your working week and in your paid hours. And those are rules. You absolutely have to undertake all of your core learning as an apprentice in your paid hours and during the working week. So what this doesn't mean is you can't do extra study in your own time at home. You absolutely can do that. You absolutely can do more reading. You absolutely can pursue other areas where you want to do a bit more prep. What you can't, though, is be in a position where because you are too busy at work, you are having to do your core learning and your core off the job study out of your working day. That is not allowable in the apprenticeship. And that's something you obviously need to raise with us if that's happening. Obviously, indeed, first of all, raise with your employer. So you can absolutely study outside, but it mustn't be because you haven't got the time or you're being asked to work outside of your working week. That's not that's rule number one in the apprenticeship. And we need to check that that is happening. OK, so what you also have to do as part of that is monitor your own learning, which obviously partly means you need to keep a log of your time when you are off the job learning. So we know that you are managing to achieve that 20 percent. And again, bearing in mind that in all of this, your employer has also agreed that this is going to be how they're going to support you through your apprenticeship as part of the rules that employers sign up to as well as um, the university so it is something they all will be aware of and of course what we want you to also do is make sure that any achievements that you have at work in your on the job activity you keep recording those so you're keeping a really good log of the skills that you acquire and of course that also means collecting feedback and testimonies where it's relevant where you know you've achieved a skill it's all about making sure you've got a rounded picture of how you're doing during your, your working time what we also do, obviously, is a, um, between the employer, you and the university is make sure we have proper, regular progress reviews. And for us, this is a tripartite review. Um, this is a three way meeting, as we've just said. And if you're not if you have a workplace mentor, it's it's really good practice to meet monthly or at least meet regularly. And we're just doing some work at the moment on our mentoring programs. So we'll be talking to you about that in the next couple of months. What we also want you to do is to record progress. Oh, I've got a missing bit there. Record progress against the knowledge, skills and experience that you need for your apprenticeship. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this because this is the underpinning structure of your apprenticeship. It's a, it is always, always related back to the knowledge, skills and experience and behaviours, if those are specified, that are set out and required by your apprenticeship. So what we're trying to do all the time is make sure that we're always going back to those and making sure that you can see and that we can see that you really are achieving those knowledge, skills and um, experience that you need in order to be ready for your endpoint assessment. So what we want you to do is do the same, is make sure you're clear where you're achieving, where you're not and what extra help you might need to do that. And you'd raise that in your tripartite review, you'd raise any issues that you've got, any concerns that you have. If there's something coming up in a module that you're not very familiar with or if it's something that you um, know you need some more support on, absolutely raise those. These progress reviews are not just about what you've done and how you got there. But what you're planning to do and what's coming up to make sure you've got maximum chance of that being successful. And of course, what we want also is to give us some feedback too about how things are going and what we could do to make your journey easier, because we are absolutely aware that you are always trying to balance, as we've just saw in the previous poll, your work, your home life and obviously your apprenticeship and your study as well. The other thing that you might not quite so well be aware of in terms of responsibilities is how important it is that you notify us if you have any changes, that you do that really, really quickly. 
And hopefully it'll make a bit more sense now why we need that, because it's so important that you meet your off the job learning 20 percent requirement. So we really need to know really quickly if you are planning to be absent, if you're going to IE, if you're going to miss an off the job um, learning session or if you're going to if you're ill on the day that you have a session at campus or if you're supposed or if you we need your assignment or if you're going to take or have any uh, unplanned leave for example if you're just obviously ill on the day so it's really important that you notify us when you do something that affects your off the job learning time because obviously that means we've got to obviously replace that learning quickly and make sure you are actually achieving your 20 percent off the job time not least because we've planned the whole program around that off-the-job learning. We know that you need all of that in order to hopefully be really successful in your endpoint assessment. So it includes obviously the kind of longer term change that might happen around if you have a long term illness or again, obviously if you're off on maternity. And also, again, I know it sounds obvious, but if there are any permanent changes, so you, you go from part time to full time or either the way around. If you have a new line manager, because we will want to step in and support the new line manager to understand about your apprenticeship. Also, if you change your name or anything about our records, or obviously if you leave and start a new role but want to carry on your apprenticeship. So notifying change is a really important part of what you do, because of course only you know when things are changing. We need to know really quickly so that we can put things in place that can kind of affect those changes. So in terms of where you might find this descriptions about your responsibilities, you'll find them in your commitment statement. And your commitment statement, like I was saying earlier, is a really important document because it pretty much is a roadmap for your apprenticeship and it includes all of the detail. And in fact, it'll tell you, for example, on the on the front page probably, although this has been a recent change, but it will tell you how many off-the-job learning hours you have to do so you're aware what your 20% hours will be. And later on in this section here, it, it takes us through the responsibilities that you have agreed to by signing the document and you can just see at the bottom of this page that you can see the, the list of what your employer and line manager have agreed to do and underneath that there's a section setting up what we will do as the university supports you and this whole point of this roles and responsibilities to help you achieve a successful apprenticeship and that's why those roles and responsibilities for your employer and for the university exist and of course what we need is for you also to take as you are doing now take responsibility for your learning and put in place all the things that you can see in front of you you here and that is about tracking your 20 percent off the job it's about participating actively in reviews and doing your prep and it's about as you would be doing taking responsibility for own learning and telling us what it is that you need and telling your employer what it is that you need to make sure you are keeping on track and are keeping pace and have all you need to be to achieve your apprenticeship successfully. So your criminal statement then sets out your roles and responsibilities. And again, it's somewhere where you might go when you want to remind us or you want to remind your line manager about what we've all agreed to do as part of supporting your apprenticeship. So what about generally then in terms of talking talking about the rest of this bits of paperwork that we provide as part of your apprenticeship. We've already seen from this how the commitment statement is a really, really useful document for you. It's something that you should take with you really all the time. So we started off talking in the session earlier about the apprenticeship standards. I'm hoping that this was something that you're all really, really familiar with. But if not, you can find your the standards for the apprenticeship that you're you're studying on the Institute for Apprenticeships website. So you can see from that hyperlink at the top. And I just happen to pick one, which is Chartered Manager. You can just see at the bottom of this kind of this page screen dump here. And what your standard will do, and again, hopefully you'll have seen this already, is it will include in it all of the knowledge, skills, experience and behaviours that you're required to do when you follow this particular apprenticeship. So it will tell you exactly the kind of things you need to demonstrate and need to make sure are incorporated in your assignments. And particularly if you have an endpoint assessment as Chartered Manager does, that has a project. So you need to, these are the areas where you look to see line by line the skills and experience and knowledge that you need to demonstrate. So having group of these documents is really, really helpful, although we also write these obviously into your commitment statement. So this is what you're looking to prove when you reach your readiness point for your gateway review as part of your prep for your endpoint assessment. And then you can see from the ring section on the right hand side of the screen that when you get onto this part of the IFA website, you'll be able to print the standard, which is that occupational standard you can see at the top of that ring section. And you can also print, although it doesn't say that this is what it is, but that that section, that purple section you can see there is actually the endpoint assessment plan. And although those are quite lengthy, um, kind of impenetrable documents, they are the, the what sets out what the university must do when we're designing our endpoint assessment process. So they're going to give you a bit of a clue as to what everybody's looking for. But of course, we will prep you 
way 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 in advance your input assessment so you'll be really clear because it's our job to steer you through the work that you do to make sure that you can demonstrate all of those knowledge skills and behaviors that you can just start to see where it says requirement on the left hand side of this particular page so knowing your standard well is a really important part of being ready and prepping up for your endpoint assessment I mentioned before about this the initial needs assessment that we have that we undertake as part of the early um, entry processes in the um, start of the apprenticeship program for everybody and again you'll probably remember this or something similar to this where we ask you about your prior qualifications and learning and again what we also ask you here is to make sure that we have any prior learning that you have and as I mentioned before the point of that is to enable us to use your any prior learning or qualifications that you have and to understand how those might affect and change what we might include in your apprenticeship and hopefully you'll also remember doing something like this, which is the which is your kind of self assessment, really. You'll be able to see in those yellow highlighted sections that what we are doing is taking the knowledge, skills and behaviours that we saw on from the apprenticeship standard on the previous slide. We are then mapping those to what we include in terms of our our modules and the learning the assignments that we actually set for you. And then what we're asking you to then do is based on what you can see from the sections, tell us where you're at. And because you've got a range of um, positions you can see in the middle of the screen that you might self-assess yourself against and that then gives us a sense of what your starting point is this is about us assessing your gaps because in reality those are things we're trying to fill as part of your apprenticeship program and that's what we're going to come back to through the tripartite reviews to make sure we're making sufficient progress that you're feeling like you are acquiring the skills and filling the gaps that you need to fill just going back to the commitment statement, the other important thing is that what you put in that initial needs assessment materialises here in your individual learning plan, which is part of the annex of your commitment statement. And as part of this, you can see again on screen that there'll be a list of modules or learning elements or activities that are taking place that add up to your off the job learning. And you'll see again in the middle of the screen, just to the right, you can see that we detail the number of hours that each of those should take. So again, you get some idea of exactly the type and the length of off the job learn that you might do. Now you may do may way more than that because you want to do some more research, you take your time over the assignment, the assignment might just be particularly tough. So they're indicative minimums. So there shouldn't be something that you feel you've got to particularly aim towards. You do what you need to do. It's just to give you a sense of how long that section should actually take. And as part of that, obviously, that's what we're going to check with you when we talk to you about that in the tripartite review. What it also should do is give you a sense of the, the scheduling of those and which, which months they will broadly be starting. And again, where we've got some advice for you and your line manager about how you can mirror some of these or practice some of these in your on-the-job activity, we'll make sure that we detail those. And often they'll be the result of discussions also that we'll have for you as part of your, part of your tripartite reviews. So this individual learning plan in the equipment center is a really important part of the documentation. Again, it's the kind of, it's a document that we're really monitoring against when we talk to you and we have your three-way reviews. The other point that might be worth, if you've not opened your commitment statement since you signed it, um, highlighting is the fact that the commitment statement also is a bit of a shortcut to the kind of key policies that you might need when you're on program undertaking your apprenticeship and I've chosen this section here because it has the attendance and absence arrangements and again for every program it'll be somebody different obviously different part of the faculty or school team but what this does is it tells you who you need to contact when you are ill or when you miss or, or because of your holiday you're going to miss a planned off the job learning session so this is what this section will do is it'll tell you exactly who to talk to who to email and what you should do so inside the equipment then it also includes some advice and guidance for you for things that might happen during the programme. So there's, there's a number of sections, including, as you can see, data protection also here. But this one hopefully will be the one you might need most, which will be your attendance and absence process. So, again, the equipment statement includes a number of these to help you navigate your way through the, the, through the ups and downs as part of your programme. The last step I wanted just to highlight really, because it's a bit of an anomaly in the process, is your apprenticeship agreement. And again, this isn't a university document, although we supply the master form for you and your employer to complete. This is a document that is between you and your employer, and it's a confirmation in effect from your employer 
that you are indeed on an apprenticeship which has a formal status that goes with that and it just sets out some of the basic information again you can see this um, from the screen in front of you and you'll know from remember from signing your own but it just sets out um, some basic details about the apprenticeship and yours might look slightly different to this if you've been um, on the on your apprenticeship over 12 months because this only changed in the last kind of six or nine months so you will have one but it'll just look slightly different and this one um, interestingly has a whole set of guidance and guidelines and that's just one of four pages of additional information that you'll be able to see if you pull down the latest version if you want something like that just ask us but you will have one that's just as valid even if it doesn't have these extra fields so the purpose of this agreement really is to confirm that you are an apprenticeship and to make sure that both you and your employer are absolutely aware of that fact so in summary then so just thinking how you can use documentation now just going back to some of the, these your initial assessment is where we have established your gaps and therefore the content of your program and that document is a really important part it underpins all the things that we put together and that's reflected in your individual learning plan which is part of your commitment statement and as we've just seen that also includes a range of policies and rules and contact numbers for you to help work your way through your program if you might need to contact somebody during the the program again just for absence or any other reasons I mentioned a second ago so it contains a number of policies like that we talked about in fact your apprenticeship agreement and this is where you confirm your dates and just to to highlight to everybody that um, this is a legal requirement it's actually enshrined in one of the apprenticeship uh, young people and children's acts and you have to have an apprenticeship agreement that is live and valid throughout your apprenticeship and if anything happened during your apprenticeship for example if you went on maternity or indeed you um, had a year out for um, other reasons we would put your apprenticeship on pause that would change your end date and we would then update your commitment statement and then you and your employer would update your apprenticeship agreement because the dates in it would have changed it has to be live and current throughout your program as does in fact your commitment statement and the fourth bit of documentation we're going to spend a little bit more time on in a second is your tripartite review and as you saw from the journey and these were the things hopefully you're having quarterly or termly at least and these are formally part of your apprenticeship program they're absolutely mandatory and they are there to, to have the whatever discussion it needs to make sure that we you and your line manager understand and can bank the progress that you're making so we're checking back over your learning objectives planning things for the future and checking there aren't any concerns or worries or particular challenges in there for you to make sure that anything that needs to be adjusted as part of your pension to help you be successful is agreed so we're going to talk a bit more about your pension and your tripartite review in a second so that's all those documentations that bundle of stuff that you had means and those are hopefully will help you understand how they can be used and how they use to form part of your program I want to talk a bit more then about the tripartite review and just generally recording and monitoring progress because this is where you'll no doubt be spending most of your time now. To start though, let's ask the question of all of you and see what you're actually doing to track your off the job learning. So we're going to have another quick poll now. Let's see how people are getting on. Okay, so let's have a look. <clears throat> so here we go, poll's just coming up. So let's see. OK, it's free for you to answer to tick away. OK, OK, we have everybody, I think. OK, I just want to wait for this to build up. <laughs> OK, interesting. I'm just going to close the poll now and share that. OK, OK, so. <laughs> so. Let's have a chat then about off the job learning and tracking and um, just think about what this uh, your response to the survey means. Well, it's really, really good news if you are actually tracking your time generally for all the reasons that we talked about before. But it is actually a requirement to track your own learning. And actually, whilst, you know, we started off the session today talking about the fact that that's a, you know, something that you actually do need to do. Obviously, if you're if you're on campus, we know you're there. You know, there are lots of other ways that we are keeping a track of the learning that you do. But you really should keep a log yourself because, again, the apprenticeship is built around expecting that you have 20 percent off the job. And if you're not getting that because you are genuinely too busy or your workload has increased since you started the program, they are going to be barriers for you because you've already told us that work-life balance and work-home life balance is one of your big challenges in those early months so we want to make sure that between ourselves and your employer that we are giving you the space 
to carry out your apprenticeship in a way that is helpful for you. So we do want you to raise this with us, but that is why you need to kind of track your 20% off to make sure that you are getting enough time to undertake the learning that you need. And if you're not, it's something we want to know. We want to work with your employer to make sure that we can do something about that. So for those of you that are um, are that tracking, that is really, really helpful. So that will be really useful. Not least, it's fantastic information for us because, of course, when particularly when we start a new programme, we want to know that we haven't um, pitched our assignments either too easy or too complex. So we want to make sure we've got the, our, our planned hours for those right. So we're really interested to know how long you spend on the different phases of your programme. OK, so let's talk a bit more about the tripartite reviews and how those might help with that particular question. I mentioned before that the tripartite reviews are a mandatory element within the apprenticeship. You absolutely do have to have them. Um, and they're the only time, really, that we formally get together between ourselves, yourself and obviously your line manager or mentor. So they are really a bit of gold dust, really. And again, it's once a quarter, once a term, usually once a quarter. So they are not big um, kind of time hungry activities, but they are really, really important. And as part of the prep for those, again, it's a bit like tracking your off the job learning. What we want you to do is to spend a bit of time just looking back over the knowledge, skills and experience and over the modules and the assignments and the project work you've been doing and just start to record and bank those areas where you know you've got really good evidence that you are demonstrating that particular piece of knowledge or that particular skill. And if you don't feel you've quite got to there, that's the kind of thing you want to raise in the tripartite review. But you will want to see some other evidence of that. I'm going to talk a bit more about this later on. What we really want you to do, obviously, is to talk to your line manager, raise those kind of points. And they might have a whole set of examples that they've seen you demonstrate that you can actually add to your kind of stock of knowledge. And we're going to encourage you to also keep, keep a reflective learning journal. We're going to talk a bit more about that later on. But again, it is everyone's responsibility to prep. It's your line manager's responsibility. It's our responsibility. And we want to come to those meetings with a really, really clear sense of, of where we think we're all going in terms of progress. And out of that, we want to have a shared view of that. So this is really all about you having a structured progress review, reviewing your learning objectives and addressing any issues or challenges. And indeed, if you're really enjoying something, looking for other opportunities to stretch that you might find useful in terms of additional reading or reading around the subject matter that you might be interested in doing. So we're going to talk about the tripartite review and how the progress review actually works in a second. But again, you can just see on, on screen that there is a kind of a set of things that we need to cover as part of those reviews. And part of that is just to highlight the fact that we expect to action plan if there are things that are needed to be done differently, where you need support, where you need help, whether it's about the subject matter or it's just indeed about the work life balance or it could be anything that is a barrier. This is the place to raise them, because if they're important, don't wait for the tripartite. Just talk to your academic mentor and personal tutor and let's see if we can do something with that, about those immediately. So the tripartite review, then, really important part of helping you make the most out of your apprenticeship. It's a really good opportunity to draw a line in the sand and see where we all are. And the agenda, as you can see, is fairly, um, you know, kind of standard. It should be pretty similar across each programme. And again, it's a, our, our kind of advice to you is make sure that these tripartite reviews work for you. Ask all the questions, seek all of the feedback, make the rest of us really work in your tripartite review because they're there for you to help you achieve your apprenticeship. What they'll typically cover in, in, a, in a normal review is there'll be um, a progress against any action plans or anything that you've undertaken previously from a previous tripartite review. What they will do then is discuss really between all three parties what's happening in terms of progress, any results, successes, achievements that you've had, quick check in terms of what your assignment grade was most recently and how you found doing the assignment. Again, talk about any on the job successes that you've had and really just agree a position, agree how that was and take forward any challenges that have come out of it and then plan your future learning. If you're doing a effective learning journal, uh, if you've picked feedback up, we want to include those. And if there are really important topics like safeguarding or the prevent agenda that we want to raise with you, we'll use the tripartite reviews just to remind you of responsibilities or explain to you what you need to know and make sure also that your line manager is aware. What we also might do is in include any milestone activities and they could just be a particularly big project or they could be, excuse me, <clears throat> something that you've been undertaking that's been you know, a particularly important feature of the programme. Or again, they might be something that we want to include with you. So we might want to raise a satisfaction survey with you or, or walk through something similar. And if it's at year end, we'll want to make sure that we're clear on the next year's priorities. What we will also do, though, is 
document this. And again, the other point of your, for your tripartite review is to think about how useful those will be. Again, particularly those of you that are on a longer programme where you've got three years worth of learning. When you get to that gateway review kind of several months before the three years are up, you're going to want to have a look back at all your tripartites and see what they tell you about the progress that you've made. They might just be able to remind you of some of the progress that you've made against your knowledge and skills as part of that. So documenting and sufficient information that's becoming an industry is a really important part of the tripartite review. So what we want to document then is progress against your knowledge, skills and experience. And you'll see in a second that our new version of our tripartite review film does just that. We'll want to check and you'll want to check that your 20 percent off the job is on schedule. So, for example, if you've had if you were off sick, you've had the flu and you miss a couple of sessions, we will want to have made sure that we've caught up with those already because we should come back to you really quickly when you tell us that you've been off ill to replace the learning. So we want to check that's been caught up. And again, we'll also, as I said earlier, want to pick up any barriers or any kind of challenges that you're particularly having. So do let us know about those and we can make sure that's part of the, the process. As it says in the next box, we will agree an action plan. And we want to know any kind of challenge or any feedback you have for us too. And we'll make sure that any actions that get raised, whether that's an action plan to support you or something that we need to do in the schools or in wider university, or indeed something that your employer needs to do, we'll make sure those are recorded and that those are actioned over the coming months. So all of these action plans are really, really key. And you should expect to have several of these at least during your during your program for things that you that you need to do or actions that we all need to take. So tripartite review agenda then should be really quite chunky and should get into all the detail. It should help you feel that once you're out of the tripartite, the next module, the next set of learning objectives are a manageable challenge for you because you've raised and had actions, whatever you might need to do to support you to get through those. And again, just a quick look at the form because we keep on um, evolving the form because we can learn new things and we, we incorporate different bits of of the kind of requirements that are on the university, but also to try and make sure they're helpful for you. So you'll be familiar with this and you'll know that um, we always have a RAG rating just to make sure that if there's anything we absolutely must action immediately, we can quickly see those in amongst our, our kind of cohort of apprentices and we can spot any trends, not just in the in particularly in the apprenticeship that you might be following with your group, but also just wider across the university. We also make sure that as you can see at the bottom, we review the actions as I mentioned before. And on this next section, what we are then trying to do is make sure we can track progress against all the aspects of your learning plan. For those of you that didn't have English and Maths, we'll be reviewing English and Maths to make sure that that's happened. We'll also be reviewing any other learning that you've undertaken um, since we last um, since we last met at the tripartite review. At the bottom, in the middle of this, you can see that we were actually now populating a proper knowledge, skills and behaviours tracker. So anything that you should have achieved from the modules that you've been doing, we will make sure that you've actually achieved the expected outcome and we'll comment on that. And again, some of that might lead, for example, to an action plan if you didn't quite get the assignment grade that you wanted or indeed you had a fantastic assignment grade and want to learn more. So these, again, will help show you and us and the regulatory framework the kind of progress that you're making, that you are achieving your learning objectives. And if you need more support, we can see that it's part of the discussion with you and action gets put in place. So again, you'll see at the bottom of the, of the form here that you have, have a place for uh, actions and targets and dates. So we can actually make sure any action plan that gets put in place is there and clear. And we'll obviously pull those out as part of the RAG rating. This also gives you an opportunity is to make sure that your comments about how things are going, what you want to see are recorded, and also that your mentor or line managers activities um, views are also recorded in the form. So we have a really good summary about where you are, kind of state of the nation, at the point where the tripartite review takes place. So all of this documentation is there to help us put a line in the sand and take whatever action we collectively need to between yourself, ourselves and your line manager to make sure that you continue on a successful journey. On that point about continuous improvement, I just wanted to segue slightly into into um, continuous improvement generally. And we're going to talk a little bit about personal continuous improvement and a little bit about what um, we want to do in terms of evolving the programme. So before we start then, another quick, um, quick question for all of you in terms of what you're actually doing to review your learning and your progress as part of your apprenticeship outside of your tripartite review. 
I'm just going to just click the poll and just launch that in a second. Here we go. That should be coming up now. So you should have that on screen. Just tick away. OK. OK, we have a good range then from what I can see from here. OK, so what the polls are showing then so far, there's a kind of a, a smattering of people that are reviewing ad hoc and informally. And we've got perhaps a third of people who aren't actually doing anything. And then a bunch in the middle who are doing a variety of the, of the options. I'm just going to share this with you now. Here we go. Again, so you can see from that, we've still got a few people that are not um, are not reviewing at all. But as I said, we've got people doing a variety of other other routes. So just bear, some, bear in mind what we just talked about in terms of the tripartite review. Of course, there is an implication for not conducting any kind of review as part of your apprenticeship, because it will make, again, keeping track of your learning and actually forming a bank of information that you can use to put into your kind of final uh, final assessment for your endpoint assessment prep particularly again if that's a project or again being and understanding what you need in your assignments will be could be much tougher if you're not conducting any kind of reviews so in terms of what you might do <coughs> what this diagram illustrates really is the is the kind of bundling together of what happens during an apprenticeship in terms of points in time where there are things that are useful to log and to record. And of course, as, as you know, an apprenticeship is 80% on the job. And it's 80% about the knowledge that you acquire, the skills that you acquire from repeating and practicing what you do because it's part of your everyday tasks. So alongside that, we obviously have the time that you spend off the job and the skills that you learn, the knowledge that you acquire as part of what you do at the university. And this could be as I was mentioned before, when you do something at work, but you are off your job, so you're finishing an assignment or you're doing some research, again, as I said before, you're shadowing, whatever it might actually be. So these are all points in your learning journey where you are acquiring something new and you are evidencing that you are meeting the knowledge, skills and behaviours that are set out in the apprenticeship standard. So it's important to keep a bit of a log of those. So, you, again, you have points of where you can demonstrate that you've been competent. We also have, of course, the output of your assignment and any other activities that you undertake when you are practicing. So it might be the learning you're applying and your knowledge that you're applying when you think through the answer and responses you write in the assignment. It could be the outcome of a project and the process of undertaking that project or any other activities that you do when you're just practicing and trying out what you do. And the other aspect of this, obviously, is you seeking and receiving feedback and making sure that you understand that your work is reaching the quality required. So you're asking for that feedback all the time, whether you're an engineer or you're on a management program, whatever it might be, whatever is relevant, you're making sure you understand you, how you're, you're, what you're delivering in terms of um, activities is reaching that competency threshold. So all of those dip out into little elements where you are demonstrating competence, where you can actually prove you could show somebody I am meeting that competency and those are things we want to really make sure that we're actually able to record and that's why it's so important really to record your off the job learning because it isn't just the fact that we are literally trying to make sure you get enough time to do and undertake your learning and that's of course why the 20% rule is there it's there to make sure because everybody knows it's hard to learn when you've got 20 other things to do is to try and give you the time to literally reflect and consider and embed the learning that you're acquiring. So recording your off the job learning is also about making a note of those things that you do, that you do well and understanding why you did them well so you can apply that learning back in the workplace, obviously. So what you can see on screen now is a list of the things that count as being off the job learning, all of which you might spend time doing actually in your place of work rather than you know, sat, in, sat on campus in a, in a, in a lecture theatre or indeed logged into the VLE and using some of the resources that are in the VLE. There are a range of things that count as being eligible off the job. And if you are doing any of these, recording these is obviously really helpful to us because it means that we know what else you're doing that is useful. But also all that time counts towards your off the job learning, providing that you do it in your working week and in paid time. And of course, there are lots of things that will be useful here. And if you are in a, obviously, you will be in a cohort of apprentices. It's the things that you learn from each other. It's the 
visiting each other's place of work and undertaking joint projects. There'd be a whole range of things, range of things that you might do. And I've left that one at the bottom about learning raid sessions that are really fantastic learning experiences for everybody, regardless of how experienced we are, to share what we each do differently in our own organisations. So planning those and visiting each other and doing those are all part of your learning experience. And it's all part of your off the job learning. The next thing I wanted to talk about was um, what you might do to self-learn and again to think about how you are acquiring skills throughout your apprenticeship that will actually change the way that you operate more generally, not simply just when you're applying the skill that you apply. And some of you may have seen this, this um, little homily here, which is about thinking about what you're told and how you deal with handling feedback. So this, this little homily says that a wise man came up to me and told me that I was a horse. But I thought he was a fool, so I ignored him anyway. Then a fool came up to me and told me I was a horse, but I ignored him because clearly he was a fool anyway. And then a stranger came up to me and told me that I was a horse, so I went out and bought a saddle. And obviously this the moral of this is that feedback is the most important thing you can take from any learning journey that you have. And making sure that you ask for feedback and that you take that in the round is a really important part of your learning journey. And recording those moments where you have had that kind of feedback that might be about you changing the way that you work or thinking differently about, about something are really important parts of embedding your learning. So what we're talking about at the university at the moment is how we support you to, to reflectively learn. And what you can see on screen now really is just a part really of, of some of the advice we might um, share with you over time. Or again, you can research these. There's lots of examples on the internet about creating a reflective learning journal. And one of the things that is often hard, it's why we had it in that option earlier, is just getting used to learning and not just simply trying to go through the go through the um, the, the the task of, of undertaking the learning, the task of doing the assignment. It's trying to give yourself time to understand what it actually really meant for you. So from your personal perspective, you can learn about yourself and how you operate. So all the reflective learning journals should do really is give you an opportunity to record your thoughts and experiences and to challenge yourself and be honest about what you did and the achievements that you've made and understand why you achieved or indeed if it was a challenge why things were a challenge and its whole purpose really is to help you evaluate your learning and to really make you poke yourself with a pointy stick to understand more about what you do and why you do what you do and of course in all of this in amongst that challenge of work home and, and study is trying to make time to give yourself a bit of reflection to help you just sit still for a moment and think about what went well and what didn't because this is how you become conscious about your learning because that's how you're then able to apply it consistently and those list of questions on the right hand side of your screen are just some examples from reflective learning journal to help you kind of set and write that kind of half a side of a4 that side of a4 that actually makes you reflect on the learning and this is the kind of thing that is really really useful to bring to your tripartite review because obviously your personal tutor and did your line manager may, may be well aware of these things and is seeing them happening and what you want to do is raise these well i found that tough because or i thought this and i had to change my mind or it might be about a group dynamic it could be anything they're all important part of you using the chance when you are learning to actually see what it means for you as an individual and that's what your effective learning journal is all about the other thing we wanted to raise, which is another area of work that we're working at um, at the moment, um, is mentoring. And obviously, as part of your apprenticeship, um, you may have a separate mentor or it may simply be you're working with your current line manager. But either way, what an apprenticeship really wants is a mentoring approach to how that relationship actually supports you to get the most out of your apprenticeship. And you can, what you can see in front of you is our kind of structure, really, which is about listening, looking and levelling. And again, nothing that will be particularly rocket science here, but they're a really important kind of hat to wear when you are in learning mode. And it's really important that your mentor wears that very much so, because they are there to be your critical friend. They are there to be your supporter. So what we want out of a mentoring relationship is, as you can see here, lots of active listening on both parts not judging or or um, leaping in or forming conclusions too early listening to people and listening to what they're saying what they what you think they feel about what they're saying and trying not to reach a conclusion until you and your mentor have discussed the topic at hand whether it's how you approach something the conclusions that you drew as part of an assignment whatever it might actually be it's really important that you take the time to unpick that and again you can see at the bottom of that left hand box that your mentor make sure 
that they understand what you're saying and you get a chance to explain it from your perspective so all the time we're trying to unpick and get to the bottom of, of what what you've been doing and what you both think about what you've been doing and because part of that is also paying attention to uh, people's body language and again from a mentor and mentee perspective you want to make sure that you you are investing in the relationship and that you are absolutely listening because what you want is good advice that you can consider as part of your mental relationship so we're looking for what isn't being said as much as what's being said and of course finally being a mentor or being a mentee is not simply a passive role you're not expected just to take feedback on its face value and again that's part of where the reflective learning journal comes in is to be to challenge yourself and challenge your views so what we want you to do is you want you to level we want you to say right this is what i think about that to ask lots of questions, to weigh up the evidence and balance the different views before you actually form a conclusion to make sure you're always what we would call roll the video on. So you actually think of what would happen if this was to, your thought process was to carry on into actual life. OK, let's reevaluate that. That might not be the outcome that I might want. So what you can see in front of you is some of the advice that we give to mentors about how to support mentees. And we are hoping to roll out a bit more of a structured mentorship approach um, in the coming months so we'll be back to you um, about that in the in the future so think about whether you might want to go ahead and look for an additional mentor as part obviously of your apprenticeship so just a really quick thing then about preparing for the endpoint assessments we get to the end of our session this morning because obviously hopefully you can see now that lots of the tracking and logging and thinking and reflecting is all really about helping you prepare for endpoint assessment and again as you can see, I won't go through this journey in, in lots of detail, but ultimately it's that point at the bottom, really. It's all about knowledge, skills, experience and the behaviours that you acquire and you tracking and banking what you are becoming competent at, because that's what the Gateway Review will do. The Gateway Review is another tripartite. And at that point, we at the university, the personal tutor, you and your line manager must decide if you are ready for the endpoint assessment. And to do that, we've all got to be very clear that you can consistently demonstrate all of the requirements, both for the apprenticeship, because of course that's what your endpoint assessment is about, but also in your role. And your line manager has the final say on that in terms of them absolutely confirming that you are ready, they think you've met the requirement for the apprenticeship and you're competent in your job role, and therefore the endpoint assessment should be a breeze. But all of the things that are before that in this flow are about understanding what you need to do, reflecting those in the assignments, reflecting that knowledge, skills and experience, collecting examples, examining, critiquing yourself and making sure that you have a really good stock of those and you're pulling those into the assignments and things that you write all the time. So finally then, a bit of a plea from us, which is really tell us about your experiences. We really want to know. I want to ask, raise my final poll of the day and just ask you about the resources that we've offered for you. And again, in this one, we have another other option. So do tell us. We really, really want to know which resources are you using. Just type something into the question line if you want to tick other and tell us what works. The more you tell us, the more we can make sure we put these things in place. So here comes the poll now. OK, so that's coming up. Let us know what you think. OK, don't have any responses yet. Let's just check. Is that coming up? Yep, it's there. Good. OK, fantastic. So could you do a few more people voting? Here we go. It's not going to be spread now. OK. For those of you that are ticking other, don't forget to type something into the question line. I'll have a look at that in a second. Let's have a look at a few, a few more people voting. We've still only got about 40% of people have ticked. So keep going for those of you that haven't yet. Okay, okay. Right, let's close that then. Okay, so just sharing this with you now. So again, we can see from this that obviously the VLE is really, really useful. And we obviously we know that's the case because, because that means you can access that in a time that works best for you in your working day. And we know we, we'd like to do much more of lots of cross-organisational projects and assignments. We know those work really, really well. I'm just going to pop the question box out now and see if anybody's typed anything into the other box. So so I haven't got anything anybody said, so let us know. We really, really do want to know which resources really work for you. So if you don't do it just quite now, just let us know in the feedback what really works for you. So finally, then, just hide that. Just want to, to touch on making sure that you always have your say. And 
we want to make sure that you take active opportunities to give us some feedback about how things are working for you. And because we, the apprenticeship is such a big program, as you saw from the start, and because it's government's flagship program, there are lots of ways in which you'll be asked to give your feedback. At an absolute tactical level, we want module evaluations to be completed so we know how the modules are working for you. And we understand your feedback on those so we can make those changes um, quickly and put those into place. So where you're asked to give module feedback, we really, really welcome that. And that goes to our course committees where those are discussed and we put changes in place. As a university, we, we run the National Student Survey and you are part of the National Student Survey, although that isn't specifically about apprenticeships, but it is an important survey for the university and it's part of um, us um, considering putting our action plans in place to continuously improve what we do for students. On the apprenticeship side, there is a national apprenticeship um, feedback, so which is literally just live now, which we're going to talk about in a second. And that is our really, really key um, feedback response about our apprenticeship programs. We want to encourage as many people as possible to fill out that apprenticeship survey because again it's really good feedback for us in terms of what works um, from an apprenticeship perspective because you are a unique set of learners in many ways and you are working at the same time as you are learning so we know there are some particular challenges for you and we want to understand how we can best meet those. What we're also um, starting to do now is to re reconstitute our staff student committees and make sure that obviously as apprentices you have a voice on those. So where you have an opportunity to elect a rep, if that rep to attend, we want to make sure again that becomes a really strong voice for apprenticeships across all, all of our programmes. And of course, finally, you have the tripartite review and that's opportunity every quarter or every term to have your views about how things are working for you and we should be actively asking you that and if we're not you need to actively say it to us so all of those opportunities to have your say as i mentioned a second ago we also have a couple of live surveys now and again those will come to you with links and we've already both been sent out the apprenticeship the apprentice survey i think went out a couple of weeks ago yeah in feb and the main education skills funding agency the big national apprenticeship satisfaction survey went out yesterday you should have an email from our apprenticeship at staff's email address and just to let you know that we also conduct all of this feedback with your employer too so employers have exactly the same opportunities to comment in our surveys that you do particularly in the efa one because there is also an employer satisfaction survey as well as an apprentice so that brings us then to the end of our session this morning, just about on, on time now. So we really want to again to know how this has been useful for you. So let us know, let us know what else you would like to know about so we can think about what we might do for future sessions. I'm just gonna pause if anybody's raised any questions, which I don't think they have. So other than that then, just to say, as I mentioned before, don't forget to fill out the surveys. We really, really want you to, to contribute to the apprentice survey, particularly the national ESFA one on the email that should have come to you yesterday. But also tell us what you need as part of, um, of this session. You'll have a, you'll have a feedback um, survey come out to you later on. Other than that, come to us if you have any queries and we will email the slides around. And in the meantime, don't forget to dust off your commitment statement and take that through and think about what that might actually tell you in terms of your own progress. Other than that, then, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your patience and time this morning. I hope you have a really successful rest of your apprenticeship journey and very best of luck. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody.